Um, as he said, I'm, my name is Kim Mueller, and I do work for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is a big, a big uh, mouthful to stay. We commonly call ourselves NIST. And I'm going to be talking about our one of our premier projects, which is the Northeast Corridor Project. Um, before I start, I actually, before I came here, I asked my daughter if I should tell a joke or something before I started this talk. And she said, no. <laughs> You're just not that funny, mom. So I promise not to say anything that I think is humorous because you probably will just, just go down the tube. So anyways, um, so this project, we're developing measurement methods and specifically trying to um, look at our research and development and see how it meets uh, stakeholder needs. Um, we work in a very collaborative way. So there are a lot of, um, oops, I'm supposed to point to this. Oops point to this thing. So we these are just some of our collaborators. They're not all of them, but again, we really like to work collaboratively. I also have listed at the bottom of the slide a number of the different research, my colleagues at NIST uh, that do the work. And um, really it's a team effort and I'm really lucky to work with such wonderful people. So the outline of this talk is I'm gonna give a couple of words about NIST, what we do. And then I'm going to introduce the Northeast Corridor Project, including some of the activities that are going on there and some recent results. And then I'm going to talk about what we found out about the policy value of our work, at least right now, and some of the stakeholder engagement that we're doing in the Northeast Corridor. And where are we going next, not just with the Northeast Corridor, but um, with our program, our greenhouse gas measurement program at large. So NIST is the U.S. National Metrology Unit uh, Institute, not the U.S. National Meteorological Institute. There's a very big difference between those two things. And if you want to know more about that, come see me afterwards. But our mission is to promote U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science standards and technology. Um, we are a non-regulatory agency within the Department of Commerce. We are a science agency, basically. And as per our mission, we develop unbiased, state-of-the-art measurement science and standards. And um, in doing so, we work with a lot, of, a lot of partners, as I mentioned before, but also a lot with the private sector. So I work in the Greenhouse Gas Measurement Program. And as our, per our mission at NIST, we are also developing measurement methods and specifically to greenhouse gas uh, measurements and standards for accurate mapping of urban to regional scale greenhouse gas emissions so that we can help um, with effective mitigation, um, science-based policy decision, and something that we don't usually discuss here in terms of enabling trade and commerce, which is, which is part of our mission. So we have five principal components. I want to point the thing at the thing, so the slide, but I have to remember to do that here. We have five different uh, principal um, components to our uh, program, but I'm going to be focusing today primarily on the first one because it's in our urban, our Northeast Corridor project fits within our urban test bed systems. These are like mini laboratories where we develop tools and methods to be able to quantify greenhouse gas emissions. So our urban test bed system was started in 2010. Um, I think we're lucky to have a couple of founders here, Kevin Gurney, and more importantly, Ken Davis. I don't know if he's in the room. Uh, he's back there. Um, and that started around Indianapolis and is commonly referred to as the Influx Project. I think many of you are familiar with that project. Um, and then we moved in 2013 to LA where we established the LA Megacities Project. And then in 2014, we moved, which I can't believe is almost a decade ago. It seems just like yesterday. We went to the Northeast and established a test bed, which is more of a regional test bed focused on the Washington DC, um, Baltimore, Maryland um, uh, cities. So um, just like what I said at the beginning, um, we collaborate or that's kind of like fundamental to our work. So these are collaborative multi-institutional projects and they include federal agencies, uh, university and the private sector. And what we do here is much of what Work Package 2 does or what I've learned about Work Practice Package 2 is that we take atmospheric measurements and socioeconomic data and sort of a hybrid approach. Some of you might think of this as an inversion. Um, along with meteorology and dispersion models to estimate urban greenhouse gas emissions and also importantly um, uncertainties associated with those emissions. 
So here's just some maps of these different urban testbed systems. And I'm going to be focusing on the Northeast. Obviously, that's outlined in red. You can't really miss it. Um, again, as I mentioned, it's a regional testbed um, focused on um, that little red square there where we have um, a really dense network of in-situ towers, um, including towers that are within the city. Those are shown in red little triangles and background towers. I'll explain more about that now. So um, we don't really, we, we're not operating these towers um, for the most part. We're in partnership with a private company called Earth Networks, and we buy data from Earth Networks. And we buy this high accuracy CO2, methane, and CO concentrations reported on WMO scales. Um, as I mentioned, there's a high density of these in situ sites within that little red box. Um, and we plan to extend our tower network up through Philadelphia and New York City. In and and expanding this network, we also know it's important to include regional and non-urban sites to help characterize background conditions. Um, and that's the amount of incoming CO2 and methane concentrations that are affected into our regional domain. And this is really important in this particular area because sometimes this Northeastern corridor is referred to as the tailpipe of the United States because the west uh, the winds come from the westerly direction and it brings along um, a lot of the emissions that are upwind of this area from like places like coal fire power plants or um, fracking fields. Um, we also take flask measurements, so we have four different sites with NOAA flask measurement uh, flask packages. So we analyze those for 55 trace gases along with uh, C14, um, which helps us be able to distinguish the anthropogenic from the biogenic signals. Um, flasks are sampled at the same time and uh, time and date through the DC network, which is really important for consistency. And then TMD, which is located up here in the upper left-hand corner, <laughs> uh, is our background site. Um, and we use that um, to subtract off of, uh, of concentrations that we measure at the other blasts to get enhancements. I asked the question earlier whether or not you guys are doing aircraft, sam aircraft sampling because we do a lot of this in the Northeast Corridor. And we do this in conjunction with some of our partners at the University of Maryland, Purdue, and Stony Brook University. And they conduct flights not only um, they, they conduct flights in our other test bed in Indianapolis, but also within the Northeast Corridor, mainly around Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, but also along the North, in New York City area. They take the regular suite of greenhouse gases, or at least the ones that we more, mainly deal with, which is CO2 and methane, but sometimes they also take measurements of CO, ozone, NO2, and also important meteorological parameters um, like turbulence. And sometimes we forget about these. They're very important because we can't really do our flux estimation um, or flux quantification methods without having good, trustworthy meteorological and dispersion models. And we use different types of quantification methods, including mass balance, scaling factor, and also this hybrid full model data inversion analysis using these flight um, information. Um, and we plan on continuing these flight campaigns at regular intervals. And um, I think the next slide shows why we think that's important. So this is a, these are some figures and results from a colleague of mine, Israel Lopez Coto. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with him. Um, but he publishes some great work. And here he's estimating city scale CO emissions using aircraft measurements. Um, so Washington, D.C., and Baltimore here um, looks like one single blob. And that's one of the, the problems we have in the Northeast Quarter is where cities kind of just, it, it's really hard to disentangle them. Their suburbs really intersect one another. And so it's hard to you know, separate one city from another. So anyways, the, uh, the red blobs, though, are defined by U the U.S. Census. So he took uh, uh, 70 flights, which is a lot of flights, over six years, and those flight tracks are shown in black, and did a Bayesian inversion framework. And what he found is that there was a decreasing trend over those six years in CO, and he was able to attribute this to improvements in traffic, uh, vehicular vehicles. He was also able to detect the anomalies due to COVID policies when people just stopped driving. So what we found from this is that air, camp air campaigns when conducted regularly 
over multiple years are a really effective tool um, for trend and anomaly detection, as well as absolute quantification of emissions. So since then, we've had multiple methods, all using airborne measurements uh, to estimate uh, emissions that have uh, resulted in the published literature. Some of those are listed here on the right-hand side. I'm just going to point to one of them um, to, again, uh, because I think it's a, it's a great, it's a great study. It's by Joe Pitt. Um, he worked for Paul Shepson, but also with people from my group. And essentially he was estimating city scale fluxes of CO2 and methane um, using aircraft measurements. And he did this, and I should just note that the, the prior or the, the bottom up emission information or emission data, however you wanna to refer to it, um, was very different in terms of its spatial scale. So he used Vulcan's, uh, Vulcan for his CO2 bottom-up emission information, which is from Kevin Gurney. I think everybody knows that, hopefully, in this room, um, which is very finely, uh, which is very much spatially explicit. It's a one-kilometer scale product. It's resolved in time at the hourly time scale. So very, very resolved. And then all he had that he felt that he could trust was the graded EPA product in um, in New York City for methane. And that product is not as, as spatially explicit. It's actually at the 0.1 degree scale. So, so very different types of granularity in terms of um, emissions information that he was putting into his um, inversion. So here are some of his results. Um, the top panel shows the variability of his emissions per the flight date. So CO2 is on the left-hand side and methane is on the right-hand side. And then he used his inversion methods to investigate the impact of different model choices, such as the prior and the transport model on the variability of his results. And the one thing that I wanted to point out is that for methane in particular, what he found is that his estimate was significantly higher than that. It's in this red, red, um, red square is his result is significantly higher than what um, the gridded EPA said um, which, or reports, which is in the blue, which is in this blue um, square. And so he wondered whether that or not that uh, that that result was the fact that he was using a really coarse um, prior or a really coarse bottom up information. So then he has gone on to create a very high resolution methane inventory for New York City and the surrounding areas. And this is at now at 0.02 degrees. And he, he updated the activity as well. So for the gridded EPA product, that was from 2012 and he was using flights from 2019. So he updated the activity data, he updated the emission factors and he updated the spatial proxy and also added in natural wetlands and rivers, lakes, uh, emissions from the, these particular um, locations. And you can see um, the prior in the upper right-hand corner, much more finely, much more um, spatially resolved. And also when you create these types of inventories, you so sometimes have to make arbitrary decisions. And so what Joe did is that he created a suite of different priors to test um, the results. And, and for all four in particular, and for, I'm not going to go into the specifics of each of these, but for the four version of the, his high resolution inventory, they all had higher thermogenic emissions than that of the gridded EPA product. And that was confirmed in his a posteriori within the inversion as well. Um, and then he was also able to distinguish that in terms of the actual estimate of a, a thermogenic um, increase too. So, um, Pretty interesting stuff, and hopefully it will be coming out soon in ESNT. So now to go to tower, tower analysis. Um, so recently we did an impact. Uh, we did a, a study on the impact of COVID nineteen on CO two emissions, and and another test bed, the Los Angeles um, test bed, and the Washington D.C. Baltimore um, metropolitan areas. This is the first time we ever did an intercity comparison. So. I um, think it was pretty interesting and, and a worthwhile thing to do. So I'm glad that you guys are doing it here in ICOS. Um, but in this particular case, we tried to keep everything the same, as consistent as possible. The same type of um, socioeconomic data that went into the inversion, the same type of meteorology, um, the same type of measurements. So we're all using Vicaro measurements. You can see that the density of the, of the measurements is pretty much the same, although less, this is obviously not the same scale. Um, 
And why would we do this? I mean, those that have worked with COVID um, data or measurements, uh, greenhouse gas measurements from the COVID time period probably could answer this pretty off, much off the top of their head. But if you look at box plots of the afternoon daily mean network average fossil fuel enhancements for both LA and the DC Baltimore area for 2018 through 2020, and you try to try to kind of eyeball to see if you can find a decrease within the interannual variability, you really can't, especially for Baltimore. I mean, it kind of looks that way for Los Angeles, but certainly not for Baltimore um, and Washington, DC. So we did an inversion, and there are a couple of things we learned. First, uh, assessing, uh, when you do the analysis, you really need to think about your baseline choice. So when you're doing COVID analysis, for example, it's very tempting to use January of 2020 as your baseline, but that's definitely not what you should be using. You should be using a baseline that had to do with the same month at a different for a different year. So deter, especially when you're doing relative reductions, it's very important to, to think about your baseline. We saw differences from month to month and year to year that were real, and that could be caused by various drivers. And in this case, we were success successful in using activity, to, activity information to isolate and attribute the changes due to the lockdown or policies that created people from stop driving by looking at the variability and activity associated with CO2 emissions. I think another surprising result from this was that we that the actual relative reductions in April of 2020 were pretty similar between the two different these two very different cities. So it was about 34%. So now I'll go on to another tower example, but this time on methane. We're kind of obsessed with methane right now. <laughs> uh, it's kind of a hot, no pun intended. I, t I said I wouldn't say any uh, jokes, but it's a hot topic right now. Um, so my colleague, Anna Carrion is using atmospheric measurements to estimate methane emissions, and she's doing this for multiple years. She's using six to 11 urban towers. Um, you can see them in the, the pluses there on the screen. And here she's delineated um, by color, um, Baltimore and Washington, D.C. So Baltimore is in blue, Washington, D.C. Um, is in orange. There's no value judgment to those colors. That's just what they are. Um, and those are defined by the U.S. Census designated, uh, d uh, defined by the U.S. Census. On the right-hand side, she also decided that the best way to go about doing this analysis would to come up with her high res was is to come up with a high resolution prior, just like Joe did. And she used a lot of the same methodology that Joe did. Um, and I have to say, I give a lot of kudos to those people who do inventory work because and, and it's it's not for the faint of heart. It's a lot of work. So this is an example, or this this is her mean posterior result on the left-hand side. And the, the right-hand sh side shows the difference between her, me uh, her posterior and her prior. Um, I think the interesting thing here is that the observations seem to have wanted to put more um, mass in the Baltimore area, specifically around the port area. Whether that's true or not, or whether that's not true, um, it, you know, sometimes we really can't trust um, our emissions at this particular scale, but we thought that was kind of interesting. So she compared her results to previous studies, all flight data, and it, they seem to correspond pretty well. But overall, um, her emissions in both the cities are higher than her prior. Um, and there's ongoing work to point to the reasons for these underestimates. And mainly she's attributing this um, with future land analysis, and I, I can't show that right now, but to the natural gas sector. Um, and you can kind of see that, or maybe not kind of see that in the time series of her posterior emissions which definitely indicates seasonality. And if you looked at this at natural gas consumption, it trends pretty well. I had to put this in here because we are also looking at low cost sensors. Um, we have an activity at NIST. We're way behind what I've heard about going on here at the ICOS, uh, at this Paul project uh, meeting. Um, so I just wanted to point at one of Israel's paper because I think it might be an interesting paper for you guys to look at, look at because he did an analysis that showed that even with enhanced measurement uncertainties, low cost sensor measurements can be beneficial to urban measurement networks. And he used an Aussie to show this. So it might be worthwhile like uh, doing an Aussie to, to test different ways of either where you're going to deploy things or um, to see how much more information is gained within the system. 
So the goals of this project is to characterize sensor uncertainties over ideal conditions. And the idea is to deploy something like 50 low cost um, sensor stations in the Northeast corridor region, um, again, to augment the measurements from these high, high accuracy analyzers. Um, he's look, working with the commercial uh, K96 Sensair sensors, but he, more importantly, I think one thing that Tyler is doing is Tyler Boyle who runs this, uh, that he's doing is that he um, is building a deployment that is really flexible so that he can kind of plug and play with, with new types of sensors as they come on the market. There are a lot of other additional testbed activities that are going on. I'm kind of running out of time and I'd like to get to the to some of the stakeholder stuff. So I'll, I'll just mention this quickly. There's a lot of other stuff that's going on um, at in the Northeast quarter, including looking at meteorological data, um, we have some eddy covariance towers that are now being placed in the Washington DC area, thanks to Ken Davis, um, to help with, uh, um, with a variety of things, including helping to characterize the suburban vegetation. And then it's kind of, this is kind of something really different. We have a SIFT biosphere test bed. So at the NIST site, we have a plot where we're taking allometric measurements as well as we have um, a handheld SIFT SIFT gun, as we like to think about it, and the and we're doing this in collaboration with um, Lucy Huteria from Boston University, Bowdoin College, and others. And the goal is to assess SIFT measurements and linkage to GPP to improve ultimately biospheric modeling. And Julia Mars at NIST is running this work. And I have a slide on this, but I'm going to move forward because for the for the sake of time. So. So we've done all this amazing work. So how do we tie this to relevance and to specifically to, to policy stakeholders? So um, in this paper that um, we explore the policy uh, relevance of the types of data that we, you know, all the all the great stuff were that we I've been showing you. And so the first thing we did is we compared our scope one emissions with those reported um, by cities like those from the city of Indianapolis, where this is where you actually scoop out the scope one emissions, and then you take the estimates and you do the comparison. And what we found is that the different disagreements can be quite large, in this case, up to 38%. This isn't a plus or minus thing. This is an actual offset. This is an actual bias. Um, we've also explored the value of mapped emissions and at these scales, relationships with air pollution, which is something that we should always keep in mind, especially when we talk to cities, um, are very clear. So reducing congestion has the co-benefit of lessening air pollution and improving air quality as shown in this example for, um, for Baltimore City. And then finally, um, on the lower plot, we found that having finally resolved um, temporal estimates can also reveal um, events that might be averaged out over time. And this can help a city decipher whether or not <clears throat> their policy levers are having a, a big impact or if there's just larger things at play. Um, for example, on the bottom plot, we did show that, you know, this relative reduction in Baltimore City, but there were other market forces that were going on at the same time, and we have to keep those into consideration. Okay, some other stakeholder engagement. So we have this um, this project that we're starting up with the Brown Station Landfill, which is a really large landfill in Maryland. Um, I just, I don't have any really great results, but I thought it was really cool to put some pictures in here to show the, uh, a landfill in the United States. So I'll just explain some of these pictures without giving any results, sorry about that. But so on the left-hand side here, we have a closed face of a landfill. And in there, I can't know if you can't see in this field, but they have all these little kind of like pipes where they gather the gas. So this can be a whole bunch of different types of gases, but includes natural gas. And they pipe it to a, a central location um, where they take actual samples of air daily to see what's in it, um, including methane. Um, this is just a picture. I think it's just kind of cool. I don't have much to say about, but this is the open face of the landfill. You can just see the whole bunch of, bir uh, of birds. And in the bottom right-hand um, corner, uh, you see the flaring, the, how big the flaring equipment is. That's where they flare the gas. Um, and I would remiss uh, without talking about another project that has nothing to do with, I mean, we're, uh, we're a small collaborator, but it's being run by the Department of Energy 
which is um, called the Urban Integrated Field Laboratories. And the, the city of Baltimore was selected as one of three cities for this particular project. And it's called the Baltimore Social Environmental Collaborative. It's run by John Hopkins University, but it has multi-institutional, it's a multi-institutional project. Um, in fact, uh, Penn State is a part of that um, back there, Ken Davis, uh, you can talk to him about that. And it also includes minority serving um, universities. Um, like I said, we have played a really small role. We're going to be contributing our CO2 observations, probably our methane observation too, as well as some of the meteorological, um, meteorological information. But it's much bigger than greenhouse gases. And, and I know a lot of people here talked about how to talk to cities. And I think when you talk to cities, other, other things that are important to cities, like public health and also environmental justice are, are good segues into having conversation about greenhouse gases. Um, and I just wanna note that there are other community groups. They do a really good job at reaching out to the community and also to the city of Baltimore and the Office of Sustainability. Um, I'm gonna quickly skip through this slide. I'm just wanted to mention that we're also seeing a need to accelerate transparency and robust, a robustness of emissions information to foster credible transactions, ESG information, um, and for our case to improve US competitiveness. So we've really entered into the financial space. I know that's wider than the, the city space, but I think it's an important sector as, as this, as this group, I wouldn't say as this project, as this group moves along, is something to consider. And then finally, my last slide of promise is um, it, knowing that, that people need actionable information. Um, NIST has partnered with NOAA um, and uh, their various labs, along with Kevin Gurney at, at NAU, to help um, and to help basically create measure model and map emissions of greenhouse gas and air pollution. So now we're really combining kind of the whole system here because uh, the mechanisms that create greenhouse gases also create air, air pollution. So in a consistent spatial and temporal, temporal way and also developing the uncertainty analysis for these particular types of inventories. And the end, what we hope is that we can do things like now casting, forecasting, hind casting of greenhouse gas and air pollutants at multiple spatial, spatial scales to ensure consistency across city, state, and national scales. And with that, I'm completely out of time, but I thank you for your attention. But I, if not now, I'd be happy to answer any questions or I would really love to hear any feedback that any of you would like to provide. Well, I think if there is a quick question, then uh, we have time for that. Anybody online, you just unmute yourself or Google. Yep. Uh, a quick question. So the, um, the it, where you showed the the, uh, the prior and the posterior for methane in this uh, um, and this, you saw this big increase in the um, thermogenic uh, methane. Um, I was wondering, um, how did you identify the, uh, the thermogenic methane? So did you include ethane or do you use isotopes or, or how do you distinguish the, the bio or the, the, well, you know what I mean? Uh, yeah, so we actually, it, for example, like with CO2 inversion, sometimes you solve for the bio and you solve for the anthropogenic separately. In this case, um, there are two cases. In Joe's paper with the aircraft measurements, he actually estimated parameters for the thermogenic and the non-thermogenic portion, as well as for the background. In Anna's case, she's using statistical results as associated with her a posteriori and, and trying to look for relationships with natural gas and other types of sectors. So it's a little more complicated for this particular case. I can give you more details later, but it's essentially looking at seeing if we can tease that out in statistical ways rather than using co-tracers. Thank you very much. So I suggest if you have question, uh, save them for the panel discussion. I think we should have time then maybe to feed them in. And I am, Happy to um, welcome now Amivu Mensha. She's from uh, the city of Zurich, oh, Kim. Okay. <laughs> 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 
sorry about that. Um, yes, so she's uh, heading the air quality division of the city of Zurich and um, basically coming now from the stakeholder side almost a little bit. So the opposite from what Kim was talking about. Well, welcome. Thank All you. All yours, Amy Wu. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, yes, as mentioned before, my name is Amavu Antoinette Menza. I'm working for the city of Zurich. I'm head of the air quality division. And um, I got that title. <laughs> I wasn't aware that I was allowed to change a title. So it's towards real-time monitoring of climate action plans. And I tried to put it in the perspective of the city of Zurich. Um, so I give you a little bit of, yeah, an idea of the city of Zurich's actions towards uh, climate and towards uh, all these things that play into this. Let's see if I can handle, nope. Oh, no, there. Okay, so um, this is really nice. So I, in this audience, I don't have to talk about the climate crisis or if it's a hoax or that it's actually dangerous and then we have to take some actions. But luckily um, last week there was the synthesis report published. And so it's out in the public again, the people are talking about it and we changed from climate change to climate crisis. Not sure if the actions will accordingly um, be more intensified. But in Zurich, we also had the climate strikes in 2019 already. So we had quite some public pressure to act on the climate issues, let's say this way. And so the result is that there was an environmental strategy developed. Actually, the person who developed this is sitting there, Rainer Zahn. He's also co-author of the talk. So if you have detailed question about that, you can ask him. Um, concept of the environmental strategy is a holistic approach. So the city of Zurich is not trying to address just one problem separately from the other, each department looking at its own topic, but we are trying to have a holistic approach where we all get together and try to find solutions that don't create other problems. So we have these uh, four goals and I go into them um, separately. Goal number four, is the intelligent use of resources. As an example, you can imagine like circular economy. So there are a lot of efforts to increase the circular economy uh, within the city of Zurich. Um, there is, for example, this uh, cross-departmental strategy that the circular economy is not only, so to say, imposed or recommended to the private sector, that, but also the government itself or the administration itself is looking at how do we purchase things? How do we increase the lifetime? How do we reduce waste? Um, then there is a consulting um, offer that we call Eco Compass that is actually for mid-sized enterprises because there are a lot of um, companies that would like to be more active in this sector, but they don't really know what to do. So the city of Zurich offers consulting and networking event to these mid-sized enterprises to look, for example, at their fleet, how to decarbonize their fleet or how to reduce waste or how to improve the, um, the stuff that uh, the CO2 budget or the CO2 footprint and the stuff that they need to run their businesses. So this is also very interesting and actually a very successful um, activity. And then, of course, there's also a nutrition strategy because by the changing our nutrition, uh, we can actually have a major climate impact. Um, the goal number three is a networked urban nature. I think this is a, a slide where you actually more or less learn German. <laughs> because I, I realized that um, for the specific German terms, I don't know the English terms. So I just went literally. <laughs> so, but I guess you will get the concept. So for example, there's an action plan for city trees. Um, so um, the, the action plan is focused on trying to increase the treetop coverage in the city from 17% to 25%. Um, which also, of course, is great for the urban climate because you would have more shade and it will increase also the biodiversity. Um, then there are also activities like the living wall systems, green facades. There's actually a really high-rise building for Swiss <laughs> standards, high-rise building. Um, 
uh, that is um, from a hospital that will get a completely green facade. So actually there's it's supposed to be a role model also for private investors. And then there's uh, a whole entire action plan also for um, improving the rec uh, recreational space. So to ensure that there are eight square meters of recre recreational space per inhabitant within 200 to 400 meters. So this is, as you can see, this is, I think, nowhere in the US dimensions, right? I mean, like you don't calculate there in meters. Here in Switzerland and Zurich, we are actually looking down to this small scale, which is actually a luxury. Um, second goal, um, the healthy urban environment. So um, the goal is to have an, yeah, a high living quality in the city of Zurich, um, despite the density of population and the, despite the density of uh, um, emission sources. So examples for that are the noise protection strategy. This is actually a very successful strategy that looks at different aspects of noise pollution. It looks at the street noise uh, in terms of very uh, much reducing the speed within the city from 50 kilometers per hour to 30 kilometers per hour, but also working on the surface of the streets so that, that the surface are uh, low noise surfaces. Um, it is uh, holistic in that sense that it's not in different departments as it's very often in other cities, depending on if it's the street noise or if it's the construction noise or living housing noise, but it's all together. So therefore we are also very active in um, evaluating new buildings concerning their noise and the noise exposure of the people who will live there. So in planning on construction, but also the everyday noise. I mean, like in summertime when there are outdoor parties and events and so on, how can we incorporate this all in a very densely populated city? Um, then of course, we also have um, the issue of uh, urban heat. Um, so there's a special planning for heat reduction that um, among a lot of things, it works on reducing the heat island effect wherever possible and, and trying to preserve the cold air systems um, I'm not sure if um, you have recognized when you went to Zurich that there are some kind of small hills to the sides of Zurich. And of course, it's very attractive to build buildings alongside these uh, hills so they have a great view down into the city. But by this way, you would block the natural cooling systems from the night. So also there we're trying to be active and try to, you know, help the people building their new buildings, how to improve it and how to be beneficial also for the environmental perspective. And of course, we try to relieve vulnerable areas and make sure that they don't suffer too much about, uh, among the um, heat. And then there's my specific area. <laughs> we have an air quality action plan. That action plan includes um, very specific measures uh, for the city of Zurich. What you see here, this is an example. Let me try to put it here. Uh, for example, within the city of Zurich, you're not allowed to have any construction machines without a diesel particulate filter. Um, and that is uh, outside of the city of Zurich, you can have that. And of course, there's always a big debate and we have to negotiate to, to implement these measures. But we are very lucky that we are the biggest city within Switzerland and therefore we can serve as some kind of test bed for a lot of things. So we try to implement certain measures. For example, we were the first to have a CO measurements on um, domestic heating systems on a regular basis or the uh, particulate emission measurements on the heating system on a regular basis. And depending on how successful we are, <laughs> when we actually um, try to prove uh, that it, it was meaningful to implement these measures, it actually evolves. It goes up to the canton, which is in bigger, next higher level. And uh, quite a few of our measures are now even in the um, Swiss law embedded. Oh. And then, Goal number one, which might be the most interesting from your perspective, it's about the climate neutral city. What is Zurich doing to become climate neutral? So um, Switzerland has a very direct political life. So there are referenda um, by the public asking for certain things <laughs> to be done. And um, 
probably hard to imagine for other countries, but actually in uh, 2022, 75% um, of the uh, Zurich citizens voted yes to a net zero plan by 2040. And it's now in the constitution of the city of Zurich. And uh, this allowed, for example, also for a new energy law that was yeah, got into effect in September 2022, which actually states, if you're replacing your heating system by now, and there's no really good excuse, <laughs> you can't put in fossil fuel heating systems anymore. So there's a there will be a, a major transition towards heat pumps and alternative heating systems. Um, and this is this is I think very specific because actually it's not imposed by the politicians, but it was actually supported by the public and by the voters. And um, to give you an idea about the greenhouse gas emission of the city of Zurich, um, actually the city of Zurich is not that big. It has 400,000 inhabitants. So if we look at the total CO2 emission that the people in, uh, or the city of Zurich is responsible for, only 25% are actually emitted on the premises of the city of Zurich. 75% are emitted due to consumption, due to other activities, right? Due to the food is not locally produced. We can't produce enough food for 400,000 people on the premises of the city of Zurich. Our clothing is not done there. A lot of construction material is imported. So all that has an effect. And actually that is 75% of this um, CO2 emissions. So there is a scenario how to get to net zero. And uh, if you like to, you could actually scan this QR code and there's a little movie. And I guess there, we won't have the time to look at it. What's my, oh, actually I have some time, huh? but I won't show you that I have extra slides. You will get other stuff to see then <laughs> since I'm so good in time. But and overall, you could actually just scan that QR code and then look at this movie anytime that you want to. I will give you a couple of, seconds to scan it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I see it works. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I think it's pretty cute as well. Maybe I should have shown it, huh? But it's in German. But uh, so I thought I should not show it in German, but I think everyone will still get the concept. So it all is nice. So we have all these action plans and we have all these strategies, but somehow you have to prove that, you know, the action plans and strategies worked. So what do we do? We need measurement networks. <laughs> you need measurement networks. And we have actually, we are in a very luxurious position in the city of Zurich. We have a lot of different measurement networks. So these five dots that you see there in orange um, here across the city, these are our air quality measurement stations. So these are the fully equipped ones. I will give you more information about them later. Then we have um, rather low cost particle sensors that are spread over the city of Zurich. Then of course, there's a CO2 network of EMPA. Then there is a temperature network that the city of Zurich together with the Canton is uh, maintaining. And then there is another one that we just more or less acquired uh, a very densely populated low cost sensor temperature network. And we wanna use the data to verify and also prove our efforts to be successful or in case if we need to correct our efforts, right? If sometimes you become up with an idea, but if the measurements actually tell you you're wrong, you have to correct. So if we look into the greenhouse gas monitoring and reporting, um, as mentioned before, the aim is for net zero by 2040 for the city of Zurich. And it's even more ambitious for uh, areas where we, the influence within the influence of the city administration, there is expected to be net zero by 2035. And uh, the direct greenhouse gas emissions of the city um, are, of course, so, oh, sorry. The direct greenhouse gas emissions are supposed to be net zero by 2040, and the indirect uh, greenhouse gas emissions are supposed to be reduced by 30% per capita by 2040. 
And now there is going to be this experiment because uh, there is a tool um, that uh, is meant to help us monitor our success. And uh, it's, as always, it's really hard. We were talking about the communication of the data that is acquired here and the success and the uh, all the knowledge that is gained, but it's really hard if it's just numbers and uh, it's really hard if it's a long text. What we really need is to try somehow to visualize it, right? And that's why they also this tool is more like a dashboard where it's rather easy to grasp the information. And I hope I managed to get it working. If I managed to get the mouse to more to the left. Where is it? <laughs> Ah, okay, thank you. So the right screen is on the left. Okay. <laughs> so let's see. Oh, it's coming up. Actually, it works. I'm very happy. So what you can see here is the uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions. And if you go over these uh, different sectors, you see the building sector, you see um, uh, nutrition, uh, you see other consumer goods, uh, you see uh, flight, uh, flights um, from the city of Zurich, textiles, mobility, um, um, waste management, and um, we have a little bit of agriculture activities. But you can actually also go into detail if you click on one of these and then you try to find out within the buildings where does the CO2 come from. And you figure out it's a fossil fuel and then you have electricity and then there's more minor is uh, from uh, district heating and the smallest part is from what is it actually biobrennstoffe how is that in english biofuels okay so this is uh for you just this is a, a minimum viable product that will um in, um, have more functionality, but it's that just to give you an idea how we try to process data, or how we try to handle data, how we try to um, also improve the reporting to, to non-scientists, because that's the thing that you have to keep in mind. Um, the, in, within the administration, most of the people are non-scientists, so it's, it doesn't really help to have extremely precise measures. We need to somehow make it you know, understandable, graspable that we that people easily can understand where is it going to? Is it going downwards or is it going upwards? Do we want it to go upwards or do we want it to go downwards? Right. So okay, now we try to go back to my talk. Will that work? Where is my talk on to? Okay, shall I do it or are you going to do it? Okay, you do it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so. Um, so, and of course, um, we can have all these great, we have an uh, emission inventory and we have all the, our measures and then we do the calculations and modeling, but in the end, we also need to measure. And then I hope we will be able to correlate your results with our expectations <laughs> that we put there. <laughs> um, next topic would be uh, urban climate monitoring. So we were already talking about the um, urban heat island, and there is a special planning heat reduction process. It's, it's a really big report, and there was a lot of modeling done to figure out what could be done to, you know, combat um, climate change in the cities. And there's also an implementation again, that which is actually more or less an action plan where we really have measures implemented what to do. And um, there is a toolbox that has 13 approaches and uh, potentially listing their impact. And the idea is that people can actually test and test environments. How would the um, different measures that were listed in the toolbox affect the urban climate in this specific area? And so we have done a lot of modeling beforehand, but it is always modeling and you need in the end the measurements we have. That's why we acquired this extra um, measurement network because we really wanna go down to the district scale and see if there's an impact when you have new buildings, if there are certain measures done, for example, like these green facades, does it, does it have an impact also for um, the environment? Okay, or measurable impact. Then um, there is of course the air quality monitoring. <laughs> And why do we still care about air quality? Um, 
first of all, I, I still strongly believe that air quality and climate change, they go hand in hand, and that if you work on the one thing, you will also improve the other thing. But um, we were actually also looking into um, the pollution burden and the associated costs, and the city of Zurich did that already a couple of years before. So what you see here is uh, actually also an EMPA modeling result. <laughs> Um, from uh, the NO2 concentration in the city of Zurich uh, in 1990, according to the um, legal limits. And the lim legal limit is um, here shown by this black bar. It's where, where there's yellow color, um, you're above the legal limit, so to say. So in 1990, it was rather challenging. You can see the entire um, city of Zurich was above the legal limit, which is 30 microgram per meters cubed. And, um, but then we had these action plans. And um, so by 2020, according to the uh, uh, legal limits in, the, in Switzerland, the picture is much nicer, right? So most of the area is under the legal limit. It's only along these um, uh, highly trafficked roads that are in the city and the highways outside or at the edge of the city, that we are still in the range of the legal limits. But then there was the health, uh, World Health Organization last year, and um, we were looking into our old um, studies on the costs, the health costs of air pollution. And you see here an old study from 2018 looking at the health costs of air pollution for 2005, 2010, and 2015. And it would have been in even 2015 uh, for the particulate matter PM10, 330 million per year. And for NO2, you see that um, we didn't achieve that much improvement. Uh, it would still be more than 760 million per year just for the city of Zurich. So we looked at that and thought like, okay, but we were taking, of course, the old measures, right? It was 30 micrograms per meter cubed. And now the World Health Organization is recommending only 10 micrograms per meter cubed. So what would that cost the city of Zurich? And that's what you see here. Again, the same picture, but now with, uh, again, orange being or yellow being the limit now of 10 micrograms per meter cubed. And of course, now there's a much bigger area exposed to over the limit concentrations, but it's still better than in 1990 because even on the premises of the city, we have green shaded area. So <laughs> there is some improvement. But if we recalculate then the costs, and especially for the particulate matter PM 2.5, we are about at 1.5 billion for the health cost associated. That includes sick days, that includes reduced productivity, that includes early death. Right? So, um, and also for the NO2, that it's still at 860 million per year just for the city of Zurich. And that's, um, I think, a very, very impressive number and uh, still sh also shows there's still a lot of work that we can do and we should be doing. And uh, for that, to monitor that, well, we have this measurement station, also an air quality network. Of course, we have these four very well-equipped measurement stations that measure all kinds of gases and also particulate stuff. And then we have one mobile, this is our fifth fully equipped measurement station that is always on different locations, depending on bigger projects that last a year. In addition, our low cost approach, so to say, is a passive sampler for NO2, which are very reliable and very easy to handle, um, though you definitely need a chemical lab to analyze them, but they're very easy to you know, deploy. And uh, so uh, on average per year, we have about 30 to 40 deployed, but in total, we have more than 250 uh, places in the city of Zurich that we try to um, uh, measure on a regular basis. So we have an idea also, uh, some kind of history about the evolution of the um, NO2 concentrations and different places in the city of Zurich. And with that, I come to the end. I think I'm in time. <laughs> so the summary is um, that the city of Zurich has a holistic uh, environmental strategy with four key areas, but they are intertwined and we work, all departments try to work together to get the, to a common goal. And we have a lot of individual action plans and strategies for noise, for air quality, for greening or for biodiversity. 
And, um, but we try to, ex um, to prove the success of our actions by uh, having really good uh, measurement networks or by collaborating with really good measurement networks. And thank you for your attention. You were perfect in time, Amevu. Thank, thank you. you. Is there any question? Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm, I'm quite impressed that you're not afraid in using dense measurement networks, but actually using and, uh, the data and working with it, improving your policy. So this is really nice to see. Uh, I have one question. So you plan to become climate neutral and you're probably replacing fossil fuel emissions with a lot of electricity, like heating, um, buildings and also traffic will be electricity based and I didn't see I, I guess there's no power generation within the city boundaries for electricity so you're probably importing all the uh, electricity and the demand is probably also growing so do you already work with the energy providers that are delivering the electricity to also help them reduce the CO2 emissions in the future? Actually the city of Zurich is an and its own an energy provider but they, we don't produce it necessarily here. So actually the city of Zurich, uh, the department is called um, EWZ, no? e uh, Energy, uh, what is it? What does the acronym stand for? Ah, Elektrizitätswerk, Electricity, um, what is it in English? Yeah, but what is it for English? Elektrizitätswerk, genau. <laughs> So actually, we have our own electricity company, so to say. Uh, so there's water power. Actually, they also have some wind farms. Um, it, of course, not on the premises of the city of Zurich, but we're trying to be um, already now we have uh, eco-friendly um, electricity supply to the city of Zurich. Yeah. Yeah, that's very, that makes it way easier then. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't buy all the electricity from other companies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we compensate that with the summer. <laughs> so I know you have a very rich data set for your emission inventory. And I would be curious um, about what data you're using for um, the food, for instance, and to yeah really calculate your footprint or the footprint of the city. Is there are also... Um, data collected by the city, or is it statistical data? Um, I, knew I should not have given that talk. <laughs> You're asking me all the questions that I don't know. <laughs> I'm the air quality person. <laughs> so no, um, actually, there's a, there's a um, big um, um, nutrition strategy that actually looked into these things in detail, and um, there is there are a lot of activities um, that for for. for definitely for the administration to change the uh, menus to be more climate friendly, but there's also the, the just recently launched the Carta with uh, a lot of um, privately owned restaurants to adjust their menus to reduce food waste. I think one of the biggest issues is really food waste, right? Besides eating meat, food waste is a really big issue. And so on that perspective, I'm not really sure how we calculated it, but I think Rainer can tell it. <laughs> okay in fact it's a good question uh what we are doing is um we are because we are quite a big city we are in in good collaboration with all the uh supermarket chains like migro and cop and we, we will get like uh local statistics of uh how much meat and how much milk and how much vegetables are sold in the city and then we use that with life cycle assessment methods to really uh, uh, assess quite cost but really uh, the Zurich specific uh, food consumption uh, from year to year because we want to uh, see hopefully that uh, the impact is decreasing yeah there's one more question from Werner before we thank break. you very much for the the insights into the into the climate action in in Zurich. My eye fell to this picture on the upper right corner. Yeah. Um, it's the the vision, I suppose. Yeah. And you don't see cars there. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I am I am born and raised as a German, and we Germans have a religious relationship to cars. Okay, yeah. 
Um, I'm so human too. How are you? And I suppose there are conflicts with car owners, with parking, about parking, about driving into the cities, parking the car in front of the of the shops. So how are you managing this conflict? Actually, maybe I give straight away also to Rainer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's as yeah we are in Switzerland, not in Germany, so we have a little bit <laughs> still emotional, but maybe a little bit less. And uh, I think we have big, uh, I would say, uh, uh, differences between uh, the city and the the neighborhood of the, uh, the the surroundings of the city. And within the city, in fact, we have really I think only half of the people that live in the city. Uh, own a car, uh, so it's it's very well possible to to live there without the car, just with public transport or with bike. So the the problem is more that the people that stay outside and they want to go in the city, uh, they are not so happy because they don't find uh, parking lots, for example. But we have quite a long tradition in in reducing uh, 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 the the individual uh, car mobility in the city. So I think right now we have less than 25% of all uh, mileage in the city is with cars and 75% is with, with other means of transport. And it was like 10 years ago, it was on 40%. And we will be below 20% in five years. And of course, uh, this is our vision. There will also be cars in, in 20 years. But the, the goal is really to reduce them as much as possible. And only what is absolutely needed that we want to electrify. But the the main the vision of of the the, the city uh, government is really to uh, uh, make the the city as lively as possible without cars, because we believe it's it's really uh, the city is not built for cars. Uh, uh, some cannot be avoided, but but overall uh, uh, we feel that you have a much higher living quality when you can do all the things without cost, in fact. Yeah. And I might have to add that in Switzerland there are not that many strikes, so we can rely on the public transportation. <laughs> Sorry, no I couldn't question. resist. Um, so I think uh, we have to break here. Um, just a very quick question. So how do you define air quality? Oh. Uh, sorry. <laughs> How do you define air quality in Munich? We observe that um, uh, sometimes when NOx goes down, but ozone uh, comes uh, up, and uh, same with PM. And uh, so, how do you account for this um, uh, combined effect for the health impact? Um, so, um, the study that we did was taking the current values into account, right, and then uh, making the gridded. Uh, uh, um, detailed analysis is how many people live close to the street and how many people are rather uh, in the background and so on. But this is actually an issue. I don't know how to account for it yet, but this is an issue I think that we will face strongly if we really decarbonize the the uh, traffic, because then uh, you you change the chemical um, balance right from NO to NO2. There's no no such thing to compensate for the ozone in summer. So we will have to see how to handle that. And that is, I think, the point where I say we have to look at it in a holistic approach, right? It is nice to take the CO2 out and take the cars out and take the NO2 out, but will the effect be an increase in ozone? So I think that we, I, I'm not aware where the studies are, the, the I mean, like. The number of studies that put before. Lucas. Where is it? The number of studies, and actually Stuart is one of the experts and Christoph also. Um, looking at that ozone and, and NOx and, and many others, obviously. Yeah, I mean, the thing is also you have to keep VOCs in, in your mind and then there's the whole effect of uh, heat stress on plants and then they emit different kinds of VOCs. I think it's a very complex thing. I can't really answer your question straight away, but uh, I think it will keep us busy for a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. I... I, I can't help but note if if Germans have a religious relationship to cars, Americans have a biblical relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my I, this is more of a comment. Yeah. You know, a lot of cities are interested in scope three emissions, which of course the atmosphere really doesn't see. It does. It just sees it elsewhere. But that's 
maybe not for the here and now, but maybe for ICO cities phase two, is that if you can do a large scale granular effort at scope one, of course, you capture scope three to the extent that the emissions are being traded, but, but it puts a burden on the supply chains, mm -hmm. understanding where commodities and products go. And there are examples of a few projects around the world attempting to do this for, you know, whole countries or sets of countries. So there's hope in using the atmosphere still for scope three accounting, though it still has lots of challenges. Mm -hmm.